Okay, so maybe I can sit here. Is that okay, or is that going to? Yeah. Okay. Good evening. Thank you for coming. My name is Cynthia Holmes. Actually, I will tell you, Buju. Buju, Buju, Buju. This is the way in Ojibwe that we say hello and greetings to you. So with that, Mashka Ogibao Ikwe in Dijni Kaz, Waban Megizi Ikwe in Dijni Kaz. Those are my native names. One is Tall Standing Woman, and the other one I received much later after I was at the college and is East Eagle Woman. But the reason I would like to share a little bit about the Buju, because there is a funny um, little story. And I, at the college, there were non-Native people as well as Indigenous people. And so the, one of the very last years that I was at the school, there was a student who was then going to be giving the final speech at the graduation ceremony. And she was not a native person. And so anyway, she got up and she was you know, just so pleased to be graduating because she told us all of her initiatives as far as driving by the school and seeing the big hole being dug and then seeing the foundation and back and forth and back and forth and just thought, oh wow, maybe I could go to college there someday. And so then anyways, she, exactly did that. I will go to college someday. So she comes in, you know, and she gets all of her uh, paperwork and all of the applications and admissions forms and letters and exchanges back and forth. And so finally she got her acceptance letter and she was just so appreciative that we had built the college in her community and now she could be educated and thusly in the future, her children as well. So she's up there giving her uh, commencement speech and just saying about how she said, you know, I thought that they liked me. She said, but every time when I got a letter from them, I wasn't really sure how to take it. Even on my admissions form, they called me Bozo. Oh, no. <laughs> so she said, I couldn't figure out why they always wanted to call me Bozo. So really, it's Bouju. And so now from here on, you probably will have a better way to remember and to know that greeting when you hear it. It's not um, hello from a bunch of bozos, but it's simply greetings. So um, anyways, I just thought I would share that little story because some of the things I wanted to talk about are not always quite as fun and fresh as finding out bozos <laughs> and bouju. So, you know, um, I will tell you my history a little bit, and I could probably tell you a couple different stories. I could tell you one in which I grew up and my beginnings and initiatives were at um, Boys Fort Reservation. When I was growing up, it was referred to as Net Lake Reservation and up in northern Minnesota. My father was a minister. He was also an alcoholic. And so I grew up there until I was four years old and then moved down to the cities. And my parents, because of my father's alcoholism, they split um, several times. They were married, they divorced, they remarried each other again, they divorced. And then he came back a third time. And at that point, my mother said, I can't do this to the children anymore. And so, you know, it was not always easy being a child with three siblings and a single parent. But you know, it gave me a lot of foundation and a lot of background to be able to think on your feet how to make um, two cents into five dollars um, and that sort of thing. I can also tell you a story that um, I Oh, also in that I was a high school dropout. When I did move to the cities, there was a lot of things going on in the 60s, all the black and white wars. And so that was a very troubling time. What I found was that as a native person, I seemed to sort of escape that viciousness and that people, they almost seemed to try to hate around you. So that when they'd see me, it was almost like, you know, that you're kind of, you know, I'm trying to hate on this other person and you're kind of, you know, 
<laughs> so there kind of became an invisibleness about who you were and your presence on the planet. And sometimes that was geared up, not so much for my family, but I heard other families that when people went off to school, it was do not talk that you're Native, don't say that you're an Indian student, you just go to school and then you come home. Don't talk about what we, where we came from and where we lived before. On the other hand, I could also say that I am a went to college, and even though I was a high school dropout, that I went to the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. I went to Rhode Island School of Design. I studied for a time in Paris through Parsons of New York. I was a Fulbright Scholar in Brazil. I taught school in Japan, and then helped build the tribal college. I also have been on theater, on stage, illustrated a book, did Prince's famous purple raincoat, and that could also be my introduction. But I will tell you that both of those stories are true, you know, so that they melded together, and I've had some very extraneous beginnings, and then fruitfulness as I had to fight and forge my own way. Um, my father, I mentioned, was an alcoholic and a minister. In his later years, though, he did become solid and penned a book. And his book really dealt with grief. And um, he's written a book about the grieving Indian. And that book really entailed that there was a different type of grief, the patterns as opposed to non-Native societies. That in the grieving situation, most often we are dealing with somebody who is sick or they're elderly and there's an anticipation about that. And we start even grieving when we first hear about their illnesses and when we see them aging and our grandmother's now 90 and we know that that's coming. But in Native societies, a lot of the deaths are where your daughter's going off to a high school party or something, and or even to the grocery store, and you never see them again. So that sudden grief really has a different take on things. And then also that combined with historical issues that that's sort of has new material and new information. And so, you know, he became really quite celebrated and traveled all over the country to well, as redemption, I guess, you know, I still run into people who have told me that my father has saved their lives. And, you know, I still sometimes in the pit of my empty stomach know that my father didn't even make me a sandwich. So there are those kinds of contrasts. But I did later, you know, in some of the years, spend time with my father and really was at his bedside when he passed. And so, you know, I've had what I would see a close-knit family. So um, a lot of my work that I had to do, you know, as I said, I was on stage and that sort of thing and in a film and um, such. But the parts of things that led me because of my background, when I was given the opportunity to be able to go and build a tribal college, I had to do that. It was for my people. So even though I was working for Prince and that sort of thing, and I don't know where that would have, could have led to, but I really knew the stability of building a college, and I also knew the instability of our people. At that time, you know, it was in 87 that the college, we began initiatives to build. And at that time, there was still every young buck out there was always talking about where are the buffalo, you know, how oh, the buffalo, you know, and that they didn't have a purpose. There was no function. The buffalo are gone, and basically so am I. And so I really felt intrigued to have to motivate and push forward and say, your buffalo are over here at the college. Now get over here and take some classes, and that's the way you're going to have to buck up. The buffalo are not going to return as you knew them, and this is a new buffalo. It's called education. And so that was really the thrust that put me into becoming a solid educator at the school. And as a result of that, really realizing how much healing really was necessary when people are still wondering, wandering and wondering about the buffalo and how are we going to go back to where we were. 
because it's we are not going back to where we were. We need to forge forward, and we need to really be comfortable in the present moment. It's important that you do know where you've come from because it does help to guide where you are going. But I think you can't really just dwell in those situations. It's very important and crucial that we have that understanding and to really find new gifts in how to function. So I wanted to just you know share a little bit about some of the things that I um, encountered at the college. I do remember one of the best letters that I ever received as a teacher. You know, when students came in, they didn't just come in and sit and be quiet and figure I was going to be saying everything. I usually went around the room and really questioned folks. I had my classroom set up in a circle, and so I went student to student. What are you doing here? What are your hopes? What are your ambitions? How did you come to be here? And a lot of that, you know, I knew had been based on some real serious critical thinking. I don't think they just drove by the college that day and said, oh, I think I'm going to go to, co oh, is that the new college? I think I'm going to go there. Let me just pull in here. <laughs> so I think critical thinking, you know, is really the essence of motivation and how do we get to where we are. And so I wanted to really find out because it's like it's critical thinking. You not, I don't think you, uh, maybe you did just drive by. But for the most part, people had to manipulate a lot of situations. What were they going to do with their three kids? Could they get time off from work? How am I going to get there? I need a new vehicle. Where am I going to live? Those are all critical thinking. And so I wanted to really delve on that and say, what got you here to this school is amazing. But please don't let that ability fail you now that we are here in this present moment. And so that's all well and great, but we need to be able to fortify that so that we can move forward and be empowered by that same kind of energy. So we would, you know, um, occasionally go around the room and I would ask the folks what their intentions were and to also talk about what not to come to school for and that we shouldn't be motivated by, is it someone's expectations that our parents thought, well, you better get to school. That's what I feel my children should do is um, be college graduates. Was it a husband? Was it employers who were pushing at you? And you know, how did you come to these decisions? So the letter, the letter, one of the most important letters that I thought that I ever received was I was teaching. I had a conversation as such, and about a week later, I received a letter from a young lady who just said, she said, I'm writing to you for a couple things. She said, I want to thank you for the conversation that we had on the first day. And she said, immediately after that conversation, I got all of my things. I went to the bookstore. I returned all of my books. I went and got my tuition back. And she said, I'm moving to southern Minnesota. She said, I was going to school for all the wrong reasons. And she said, thank you for giving me the permission to change my life and to do what I really needed to do. So she said, the two things are, I really don't know what I will miss by having moved away and left you. And then also, if you ever come down to, I don't know if she was in Mankato or um, where, you know, it was one of the first letters that I had ever received from a student. But if you're ever in the area and you're ever doing a workshop or a lecture, please call me and let me know. But so I think, you know, it's important to really be evaluative at no matter what situations we are and how to utilize, are we really moving forward and where is the momentum and the drive for that? So I really was in appreciation, you know, of that people did actually listen when you spoke with them and if they could be honest with themselves, then I think that we had a good group to move forward with, you know, so it was always kind of talking from that situation. So a lot of the times when I was working with people that needed to be have healing, you don't always know that right off, but that was really my goal was not so much just to teach people how to draw, but how to communicate, how to see, how to listen. Because I've seen so many that people, when we're watching television or something and someone's there and pretty soon it's like, oh, I'm sorry, what were you saying? It's like, well, you were right here. Well, yeah, but I, what, I, I heard you, but I didn't listen. And people also, I think, have that same kind of seeing um, situation where they see what they want to see. 
And so in the drawing classes, you know, it was a two-year college. And so the art that I taught was, for a lot of people, their fill-in classes. And so when I was teaching a drawing class, and so I just said, you know, well, let's be honest here. How many are here just for the credits? Well, it's like, let's be real about it. You know, how many of you think what I have to share with you does not pertain to you? You know, and then pretty soon it's like, okay, well, let's talk about this. And so it's like, okay, so I had two guys that were in the back row, big bulky guys, you know, and in the back, you couldn't get farther back. And so I just said, you know, um, what, kind, what is your interest at the college? And they said, we're, we're law enforcement. And so, you know, we need the credits. And so that's all it's really about. And I just said, oh, I think your whole initiative is to protect and serve. Doesn't that what it says on the car? But if you don't know what you have to protect and serve, how are you going to do the job? And in order to do that, you have to first observe, isn't it? So they're listening, you know, and I said, okay, I said, well, let's talk about this. You know, really what my hopes are is that you find a better way to have observation skills. I said, you know, two people can walk in the same room and they can look at the table and say, oh, um, well, I was in the room and I saw, I don't know, there was an ashtray on the table, there was a cigarette butt. The other person can come and come out of the room and say, I saw a cigarette butt in an ashtray on the table. It was halfway smudged out. There was red lipstick on it, and it didn't look like the person was going to be any too happy with whomever they were waiting for. So now that being said, which kind of a partner would you want to be riding with? And so anyways, we had a few more um, chuckles. And what was interesting, the very next time that we met, the two big bulky men were in the very, very front row. <laughs> they couldn't get any closer to my desk than if they were going to sit on my lap. And I was kind of taken aback. And I said, oh, my. And they just said, everything you said was true. We were really wondering maybe there should be a situation where this could be required for all the law enforcement department. And it's just that, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> I'm just wanting to help you to move forward and get the best and be the best policeman that you can be because you chose to be here with me. There was a nurse who was there. And um, she was talking about, oh, well, you know, I'm going to the nursing program and this fit my schedule. So it's like, oh, okay, well, we can talk about that too because observation needs to serve you just as well. I said I had a coworker, and I heard her talking one day. And so what she was talking about then, she was sitting in her office, the head of nursing, and she said the student came up behind her, and she was quite irate because she said, you know, she said, I missed that by two points. She said, otherwise, I'm a straight A student. And without even turning her head, the nursing student said, the nursing instructor said, if we were in a hospital setting, two decimals, you could kill someone. And never turned around or anything. But so I said, so observation can serve each and every one of you that you think that this isn't for you. But if I can teach you how to see, if I can teach that policeman to reach for a pencil instead of a weapon, then I think my job is accomplished. So they weren't all just... Um, cops and nurses and teachers and that sort of thing. But I did um, occasionally run into a fine art student. And so, you know, one year I was um, doing painting and there was a young man and he was just so, actually, he, you know, I wouldn't say that young, but he was engaged in a painting and it was toward the end of the semester and he was painting away and he was really sort of in his own element, you know, had really found grace uh, with the painting. So he's painting away, and I'm coming around to see what's going on, and then all of a sudden out of his mouth he says, um, oh, Cynthia, he said, I just have to tell you, you remind me of my grandmother. And I said, grandmother? And all of a sudden he was right there in the same moment that I was in back in the room. And he was like, oh, oh, no, oh, um, Oh my gosh, um, no, um, oh, my grandmother really was my grandother. 
He said, we called her my grandmother. She was my step-grandma. He said, oh, she passed away when she was, um, she, he said, I met her when she was 47. She passed away when she was 52. He, and so it was like, oh, oh, okay. He said, but your personality and your character, even how you dress, everything, you just, my sister is the one who told me to come and take this class because I would find the grace and the beauty of our grand other and that, so it's her, she told me to take this class. And I said, well, oh, I didn't know any other student with the same last name. Well, the sister had been my student about three years before, and I did not, if there was ever a rebellious art student, other than myself, <laughs> it would have been her, Nina. And so he said, well, Nina Holtz is, I shouldn't have said the last name, <laughs> Nina was my student. And so I just said, oh, my goodness. So anyways, he said, yes, she told me that I should come and to take your class. And so, so anyways, so we had a good meeting that day. And he just said, I just wanted to, what I started was going to say is that when I come into your studio space, I feel love. And he said, I don't feel that anywhere else in this whole college or this whole building. And he was a grown man and saying, I feel love when I come into your space. And I'm really going to miss that. And he was a grown man. Um, a couple years, maybe three years had passed. And then one day, we're doing a new group of students. And we're doing our swing around and who are you and why are you here? And there's a lady who is almost close to my age, and she's seated there. Her name is Kathy, you know, and all the other youngins, so to speak, had their stories to tell. Well, Miss Kathy starts in, and she says, well, oh, I'm a mom, and I have two kids, and... Oh, you know, I sometimes I like to paint and I garden and oh, I don't know. I'm just I'm I'm an old dinosaur, you know. But I don't I don't know. <laughs> so I just said, oh, just a dinosaur. I said, you know, and it happened. Things usually always kind of they say it happened for a reason. And so then what I proceeded to share with Kathy was that I said, you know, I just saw a. a program the other night and I was too enamored in my artwork to get up and change the channel but they were talking about um, Kentucky Fried Chicken and the grandpa um, who made the chicken empire and so I said does anybody here know how old he was when he started his chicken empire well I don't know 37 it's like no oh 40 no no it's like 50 no. I said he was retired. He was 62 years old when he began his chicken empire. So I said, Kathy, when you say old dinosaur, I think, you know, of anybody in this classroom, we're the only ones who are maybe close in age and in preparation to really be able to do something and accomplish something wonderful and without hesitancy and a lot of mistakes and, oh, I this or that, but to really be able to forge forth. So I said, I think um, that's how I would welcome you in. And then she proceeds to say, you know, she said, really, the rest of my story, she said, I've had cancer. She said, I had breast cancer. And she said, I've had my two children that I spoke of. She said, they have come to this college. And they told me, both of them, they said, Mom, please go to this college. We know this lady who's going to really make a change in your life, and she's going to help you save your life. So please, we beg you to go to the college and go and take her classes. So then she shared, so that's why I'm here. And then she had said, my um, students were Steve, or my children were Steve and Nina. So um, there was two generations there. Kathy's husband later came and joined the college. He was the only one of them who was not native um, by birth. And his children, though, however, were, because Kathy was indigenous, and so thusly Steve and Nina, their children, were. But her husband, Larry, came along. He was Larry the cable guy. 
And I guess he drank a little on the side, and she wasn't always really crazy about that. But when he saw his children and his wife come to the college, he decided, hey, maybe there's something over there for me. He did not come in my classroom and be my student. However, he came and was <clears throat> participated in the art club and um, the potlucks and all those kinds of things. But so Larry the Cable Guy came to the college and he decided that he would study the Ojibwe language and he became a star student in that capacity. So he, his commission really was that he wanted his grandchildren to speak the language. And so that's what motivated him to come to the class and to be able to be a star speaker. This past February, I had to speak and eulogize Larry, Kathy's husband, Nina and Stephen's father, and do a prayer for their family and he had passed of pancreatic cancer. But, um, you know, I just want to share a little bit about how sometimes things are generational and how you can reach not just one person, but everybody within that whole family range. It's been really, you know, a star spectacular. I'm good friends to this day. In fact, I just spoke with um, Kathy just this afternoon because there was a name that I could not remember and I, she answered and yes, and she told me the name. So th those were the kinds of things that I've been able to work with people and to be able to help them with healing elements in a very personal situation. So um, what I needed to find out, Kathy, it's just like, Kathy, what was Kyle's mom's name again? And um, her name was Virginia. And I thought, oh, how could I ever forgot that? I was born in Virginia, Minnesota. And so one day I get a call from a counselor who was in human services, and he called me up at home and he said, Cynthia, he said, I have a student and she's a little bit older and she's having some issues, and she's ready to leave school. And she wasn't my student. I had never met her. But he said her name is Virginia. He said, I know we have plenty of counselors at the college who are trained and you know psychologists and that sort of thing. He said, but I don't think they're going to serve the purpose. He said, and I was wondering if you could take some time to speak to her. And before he hung up, he said, oh, did I tell you she was Navajo? And I said, no, but I'll be right there. And so um, before leaving the house, I picked up a piece that I had, and I hope that nobody is a conservation officer. <laughs> I know you're a nurse, and I know where you work. And so anyways, um, I would think time limits would run out anyways. But what had happened was, um, Oh, probably about 10 years prior to that, I had been down in the Southwest and had gone up onto the mountains of the, um, how do you say it? Um, T-W-S-A-N-K-W-A-I, maybe. <laughs> Sawanke um, native people. And had gone up into the Pueblos and up into the mountains and climbed around and was there by myself. And I found a pottery shard. It had a little hole in it. And of course, it said, don't take anything from here. But I just had felt at that time in my life that that really was an element that was my ancestors, that I needed to take that piece with me. And so I did. On the morning when I was going to go and meet with Virginia, I had picked up the, I was wearing it every, every single day since I had taken it off the mountain. Um, there was one day when um, I spent a lot of time with my brother who's been very sickly over time and had misplaced it when I was sleeping. I think I took it off and I thought put it on the table, but really I'd put it into a jar with some other rocks and didn't really, wasn't aware. So anyways, when I had felt that I had misplaced it, that I was undeserving to have it in my presence anymore anyways. So I grabbed the pottery shard and went off to school. So I spoke with Virginia, and she was really having a difficult time. She was somebody's mother, and she, 
um, had already been teaching and things, but what was happening was they wanted everybody to be accredited. And so even if you had been teaching or um, been a grandmother who would come and speak the language with the children, those kinds of things, it was now time everybody had to belly up and you had to get a degree or you could not function in the schools anymore. So Miss Virginia was coming over from the day school. And so she said, you know, I'm just so tired of being in these human services classes. And at every single moment, this particular teacher, he starts out every story about this poor little Indian, these poor Indian family, this poor, terrible Indian family. And she said, I just can't, I don't know what to do. She said, I'm so ready to be leaving school. She said, I don't know how to confront them, how to say. Well, in the back of my mind, I was getting, you know, sort of this other information that tell her she needs to maybe write the handbook and correct the situation. You know, and it's just like, I can't be saying this. That isn't what she's here for. But, you know, it's, how do you argue with spirit? And so finally, I took the pottery shard and I said, well, I have something for you. And I said, I don't know if you're comfortable with accepting this or what you would have to say about it. I said, but I have a, um, a pottery shard from the Senkawi um, Pueblo. Um, I took it off a cliff. And she said, oh, she said, um, well, she said, just before we came to school up here, she said, I went to a ceremony and she said, and there was a holy man there, and he told us after talking to us that if we ever encountered a pottery shard, that we could now take that, and we could have it, and we could keep it, and we could understand what was going on and to help ourselves to it. It was okay. And so I said... When did you come here? I thought she was going to say, oh, last summer or <laughs> a year ago, that sort of thing. And she said, 10 years ago. And I said, 10 years ago? And she said, yes. And I said, you know, 10 years ago, I knew conferences and things that I had gone to. So I said, 10 years ago was when I was up on the mountain and was when I took the pottery shard. And how do we know or not know that that same 10 years ago that you were at that ceremony and that that person gave you permission and that here is the peace? So ultimately, Virginia stayed in school. She had a young son. I was at school for 32 years uh, manning the ship the canoe over there <laughs> at the school. And she had a young son. and. Um, so he made it through high school. His name was Kyle. And so Kyle had the unusual situation that he was born with his spinal fluid could not get through. So there was, he had some issues and some learning challenges. And so he had managed to get through high school. And then he was going to be coming over to the college. And so most indigenous people are really... Uh, gravitate towards the arts, and they usually can really manage and do quite well. It's a visual situation. It's a historical situation. It's a cultural embellishment. So usually folks can do quite well, even if they you know, have not had years of composition and other kinds of artistic efforts. And so Kyle was going to come to the college, and he came in, and we did some really great things, but there were also some challenges uh, that Kyle had. Kyle, um, to get his degree, which his parents always reminded me that they didn't think that that was going to be able to happen. But when they talk about, you know, that it really, it takes a village, the students, Kathy and Larry and Nina, really stepped up and helped and made sure that Kyle could get rides. He lived in Duluth. We lived, the school was in Cloquet, probably a 20-minute mile um, drive. And so we're willing to bring Kyle back and forth when he needs, when he ever has an issue or a late night class, and we'll take the same class with him. Uh, Larry, we had to have physical education classes, and so Larry decided he would oversee Kyle, that they went on this sort of 
uh, weekend camping sort of thing where you had to canoe and you had to do ropes and you had to do all kinds of different things, but you could end up with your um, three credits that was necessary. So there was a lot of people that were involved with helping Kyle to find success with managing to get through school. Um, I kind of almost had to get in the back seat myself because we did the Indian art class and we were going to be making moccasins. And then, you know, we were always making pucker toe Ojibwe moccasins, but Kyle's from the Southwest. So all of a sudden when it's like, Oh, not the Navajo up wrap around the ankle um, with the <laughs> buckles. So anyways, we proceeded and we did that quite beautifully and very successfully that he made his own moccasins, not just copying the Ojibwe ones, but to manifest from his own tribe. So we, he, he did really go above and beyond things. Um, you know, part of my situation of teaching I, don't, I could have done it without my family, but they were really strong contributors in the situation. We went on a lot of field trips, and one, we had an art club as well. And so some of that entailed that I later had taken an apartment um, in Minneapolis right across the street from my parents. My mom was getting to in her late 80s, and I wanted to be close by, so I would drive home and have my apartment there on the weekends and then drive back up on uh, Mondays afternoons. And so also it was a great place place that if I wanted to do field trips, we could go to Minneapolis. My parents would come over. They would make a fabulous buffet dinner for my students so that we didn't have to spend on school money, that I didn't have to um, spend $500 to feed 25 people, but that we could give my mother $100 and she could make chicken divan and a great salad and French bread. And the students just loved it. Sometimes maybe even more, who doesn't gonna want food before a lesson? So I think sometimes they were more attracted to my mother and father, stepfather at that time, and to all of their delicious offerings as opposed to uh, what I could have single-handedly put forth. So there was something really homogenous about how I um, approached the teaching and how I was inclusive of bringing my family in. Shortly before uh, leaving Cloquet to come down here, I was up seeing Kyle, and he is now working at Black Bear Casino. Most often his family had thought that the chances of Kyle ever being able to have a working position was probably slim to none. But because of this horrendous blessing called COVID, the casino was really short on staff and everybody knew him, everybody liked him from the community and they said, hey, why don't you come over and try out a security job with us? So he's been really thriving there now for, oh, probably at least a good six months. And so when I saw him the other day, what really warmed my heart the most was that we were standing outside. I was checking in and he was like securing the building, I guess. <laughs> so actually maybe he was outside smoking. And so anyways, we sat outside and had some really wonderful stories. It was really, I felt so blessed that he was recalling about my mom's hot dishes. My mom has passed now by four years. But when I really realized that here's a student of mine who nobody ever thought could graduate, and here he is working, running security, and we're laughing about my mother's hot dish. So I don't know how many college students have been to their teacher's house or knew their teacher's mother and that that mother had prepared dinner for them. So those are pretty welcoming situations um, on my family's part, so that when I talk about it takes a village, it takes a community, and sometimes it takes a whole family to teach the um, class. Um, you know, not all the stories were always so pleasant. Um, when I first got to the college, I had encountered a family who I first had run into them. I was working for AIM 
before I even knew what they were. So there, I was working at Red School House. It was the AIM school. And I had met um, one um, a sister down there. There was three sisters. And so that had to be 10 years before I ever had darkened the doors of, of building a college. And so when we first got to the college, then I met up with her sister and they looked identical. They were beautiful women. And I had to actually ask to see the ID because I couldn't believe it wasn't the same person. So um, the three sisters, they all ended up getting their degrees from the college, uh, two of them in teacher's education. The other one, I'm not sure what her degree was in. The third one was probably not so, sex, so successful as her other two sisters. She later died of a meth overdose. I, the two women um, that I worked with, or th that came to school, that I worked with, that are my friends, her, one of the women, her daughter came to school, Angel. Her mother was Dawn. And so Angel came to school and she was taking the Indian art class with me. And we were having a great old time until one weekend when Angel's daughter ended up bludgeoning to death Angel's sister, Dawn's other daughter. And it was over meth situations. Um, and in a blackout sort of situation, when she was arrested, she didn't seem to have any collection of what she had done. But police had found uh, remnants of her burned clothing in an abandoned house in an oven. So they were trying to piece together, maybe you did know something or remembered at some point. I didn't think I was going to see Angel again because of the situation. But as I say, it was an Indian art class and she was in the middle of doing some bead work. And well, if you ever know Indian beaders, there is kind of a lifetime commitment to that. And, but because of all that went on, it was just so horrendous when your daughter kills your sister. And it was probably about oh, maybe a week and a half later, and we were busy working, and all of a sudden here comes Angel coming into the room with her beadwork and stuff, and came in and sat down and started to bead. Um, Angel did end up dropping um, the classes, you know, that year, but just to illustrate, you know, how effective the arts and the necessity for that can be. I just kind of wanted to share with you a little bit about that capacity. So it can be a lot of one-on-one -on -one sort of things and you can really help people independently change their life and move forward and really find great success no matter what kind of turmoil or whatever how harried their beginnings might have been. Um, you know, also then my own art, I've had to constantly work at because of these issues. I can't always be carrying these things with me constantly. So a lot of times it is having to try to get them out and get them away from here and to release them because that's the only way that I really can find a way to move forward. Otherwise, it's just, you know, you might as well have a backpack and just keep filling and filling and filling. And so in order to empty that, I do oftentimes, the paintings then become also sometimes a community effort that's a story that needs to be told and to be shared. Um, I've been asked, you know, to different um, agencies of, can't you come and help? We're going to have a social work, um, social work convention, okay? And like, can't you come and, and like save the people? It's like, <laughs> save the people? I think they're social workers, like, don't they might maybe know a little bit? Oh, well, those things are so boring. And so if you could just come, can't you bring a hands art something or other? And I just thought, well, maybe perhaps I can. And so I did um, show it up at the downtown Duluth at their human services workshop and presented a healing hearts workshop. What that entailed was that I asked my own 
students that were in uh, working, well, I asked two groups of students because I wasn't sure if I was going to get a response. So I asked the ones in Indian art and I asked also my ceramic students. And I said, what we're going to do, and you can say no, but what I'd like to do, I'm going to be going to the Human Services um, Conference, and I would like you to build me some clay hearts. We're not going to fire them. They're just going to be raw clay, and then we'll just hand dry them, air dry them. But I would like you to do um, something for me. Because I said, you know, I think we all need partners in prayer. Like sometimes we feel that our prayers maybe are sometimes feudalistic at times, and we don't always see the answer, or we don't always see the answer that we'd like to see maybe. And so I said, wouldn't you like to have a prayer partner? And so the way that we're going to do this is we're going to write someone's name on the piece. And if the person is on this side, we will write them in red if they have crossed over and they still need help. Um, we'll write the names in black. And so what we will do is we will write the name, kind of like a little fortune cookie, and then we'll put a slash, and then we'll put what the issue is. And so um, I had a really good friend at the time who was suffering from leukemia. And so I wrote Carrie in red and then leukemia and then made a little clay heart and fixed it all up quite nice. Oh, my students couldn't wait to participate in the situation. And so I had... Um, Many students, well, they started engraving on the clay, and um, somebody was working with twins. They had a double heart. Um, by the time they were done, I saw things that were saying sister, brother, father, many different kinds of things that they had etched into the raw clay. So I took the pieces. I was going to then present this workshop, and it was going to be healing hearts for the social workers. And so the idea was, was that they were going to come to my workshop. They were going to select um, one of the clay hearts out of a beautiful birch bark basket. And they were going to come up and then into a, another box. You were going to break it open like a fortune cookie. And then you were going to discover the name and the um, issue. And then you were going to take that and you were going to make a little bundle. And you were going to put sage into that bundle. And you were going to put that little piece of paper. So you were supposed to really think on that and really see what it said, absorb that whole concept of who it was, say some prayers, and try to hopefully really remember what the story was about. But all it had really was a name and then the issue. Put it into the little bundle, and then you were going to wear it. And you could wear it for you know really an undesignated amount of time. And then after a certain time, maybe you felt that you were going to leave it in the river or hang it in a tree or maybe bury it. But that if you had put a little bit of energy into that for that other person so that there could be a strengthening and a multiplicity to that prayer. So um, we get over there and I guess Coquet and Duluth is a relatively small community. One of my students who had made the clay hearts had recently lost her father, and she had put in there um, her dad's name, and I think it was heart attack. When we got to the event, her mother was there. Her mother was a social worker. Her mother came up to that box. She selected her daughter's heart that she had made that said father had his name in there and the heart attack and she the, of all the hearts that were there I probably had about 50 of them and she picked up that heart and of course when she broke it open and then she also recognized her daughter's handwriting and knew that that was her husband and just started to weep over that box of broken clay there was another lady who came and she had, well, not a three-piece suit. Women have, okay, skirt, jacket, oh, prim and proper, high heels. And she was marching along there and with a couple of her friends. And she comes over to the basket. And she said, oh, I think I'll take this one that says sister. So she puts down her lovely little handbag and goes over to the box in which she was going to break it open. And she breaks it open. And it had a woman's name in it. And it said domestic abuse. And the woman in her 
two piece, two and a half piece suit, <laughs> began to weep over the box as well. And she said, oh, my sister, she said, my sister's just in a terrible place. She said, she just beat me up this weekend. And she was crying as well. But the people indeed, you know, took the names, put them into a little pouch, and then wore them and took them. I had a former student who was there that day who was um, now a social worker. As I said, it was 32 years. <laughs> so she was now into her career. And she comes over. Actually, she came over the next day and said, oh, she said, I just have to tell you something. She said, you know, she said, I work with this little native woman. She said, and I came yesterday. She said, I was wearing my pouch. And she said, when I got to her house, all she could do, I don't think she heard half of the things I was saying because she was so intrigued with my pouch. And she said, and I knew, you know, it really had such significance to me or otherwise I would have given it to her. And so I knew that, you know, I had to do something for her. So she said, I was just wondering, can I come today and make a little pouch for her? And it won't have any names in, but if I could bring that, make that pouch and bring it to her. And she said, and furthermore, she said, I just wanted you to know, as an instructor, how even though you're here at the social work conference, how you're touching somebody's life, an elder lady who's sitting at home, on her couch, can't even move around very well, and you're touching her heart. And she said, and I just wanted to let you know that. She said, I thought it was really important that, that you know that, that you are, can reach and touch people even when they haven't even met you and they're not in your presence. So there's many ways in which we can work with community. And so I've been invited here um, to Crazy Horse for the month. I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And so the one thing that I then decided to do, I've been working usually with these kind of paintings in the format of a great big, huge canvas. And you know, <laughs> trying to manipulate that about the place is not an easy task. I had, in the previous times, painted on hides. And so at that moment, I had to realize I'm never painting on a box in canvas again and having to have that struggle. I was moving in the middle of December, and I just thought, I will move my own Tiffany lamps, and I will move my paintings. And there I was in a snowstorm, and I could not get into the back seat of the car. <laughs> <laughs> and almost crying. It was a terrible situation. And so I just thought from now on, I will do it, everything the way we did in the past. We, whether they were dreams or whether they were winter counts and describing a history, I'm going to be able to roll these up and put these under my arm and take them. <clears throat> so that's how I have moved forward. And then really to talk about healing when you're working within a community, you could see sort of the hands-on things. But I also thought it's important to be able to tell a specific story and then have people have to grapple with that sort of thing on their own. And so I've been working on a couple pieces since I've been here, three to be precise. Two of them are the beginnings that are behind here. I'll explain a little bit about them. The third piece is I am working on a hand-tanned, hand-smoked hide, deer hide, and it will be pre-contact. And so that's hanging upstairs in the workspace that I've been so afforded. Um, and so it's a hand to hand piece so there will be no metal there will be no beads it will be really speaking of pre-contact so quills and bones and shells and feathers and horse hair those kinds of things the second piece that i am working on is this piece and this piece is a tribute to the boarding school survivors. This is done on a hospital bed sheet. I thought it was important to be able to utilize that than a fresh canvas or linen or that sort of thing because um, that's what they did, have to sleep in the little twin beds and things. And so this is a sheet that I really had to fight to get because when I called hospitals and different places, they were kind of tight about their merchandise. I said, I'm gladly to pay you. Well, someone said, our logo is just all over the place. They had agreed already. And then when she spoke to the owner and he said, well, our logo's on there. It's like, we can cross it out. And it's just like, oh, you know, well, 
that's not going to happen, but thank you for trying. And so anyways, I made a few more calls down to Chicago. And then the next thing I was back uh, from Chicago to Eden Prairie. And they, I told them what I was doing. And they said, please come out and get it. And so I said, well, I would be happy to pay. And they said, no, the work that you're doing, please just take it. So the border print that's on here is seventh generation survivors from boarding schools. My grandmother went to boarding school. My father went to boarding school. So my third cousins, I, there were six and 10, and so, live in Florida. So I went down to Florida and then thought, well, oh, kids, can you help out with this little project? And oh, we're going to do some handprints and tried to really undermine the whole th situation. And so finally, the six-year-old, you know, they were having fun <laughs> until he's like, this looks like blood. And so I didn't really want to disappoint and to delve there with a six-year-old. So I just continued on and just said, well, red is really the favorite color of the Indians. Don't, you know, that, that's, here's your pay, okay? <laughs> and so we moved forward in that regard. And so the sheet itself, I'm going to print um, and stencil Carlisle onto the border here. And then these are the ancestral people. I was going to have this all done for you today, but then I couldn't find my blue metallic paint. So I'm going to use this as a stencil. So when I paint around, we all did those chalk dust drawings as kids. So when I take it off, you'll see where these ancestral people were, not that they're here. I'm going to put a silhouette in here, applique um, black silhouettes of a mother and two small children in regalia. So that's about as far as I have figured for this piece. The third piece is a tribute to murdered and missing indigenous women. It's something that's really affecting everybody everywhere. I have a friend, um, Kathy. We were doing, I was doing ribbon skirts and trying to heal you know, a community in southern Minneapolis. And anyways, um, well, you know, we were making ribbon skirts, and so it's usually, it's a lot of work. So I wasn't necessarily saying, oh, well, where were you from? And, you know, um, oh, tell me all about your background. You know, it was just like, oh, that needs to be hemming. Maybe we should have another row of ribbon down here. So there's, you know, a lot of things going on. So I happened to go over to the lunch table and was just going to have a snack. And then pretty soon I've seen somebody pulling at my um, shirt, interrupting me. I turned around, and here's this little lady. And she has this pan holding it and says, would you like some peach cobbler? She said, today is my daughter's um, birthday. And peach cobbler was her favorite. She's been missing for 10 years. I was just so silenced and so devastated. All I could get out was, I would love some peach cobbler. Uh, we became very fast friends um, as a result of that day. We finished up our skirts. I later helped her make a red shawl, and we did put her daughter's picture on the back, and we later went to the march on Valentine's Day that year. And it was, you know, I don't know if that was really the appropriate thing to do. It might seem a little garish to some, but we had a red shawl, we had the red fringe, and then her daughter's portrait on the back. Well, we were not even marching for about five minutes, and this lady came rushing over to Kathy, and she says, oh, oh my goodness, she said, Kathy, she said, um, I've been wanting to get a hold of you. The woman was from the Jacob Wetterling Foundation, and the Jacob Wetterling Foundation was... Um, started because Jacob Wedding was from Minnesota and he was kidnapped when he was a really, really young boy. And so that's when they first started to put out besides the milk carton situation to have a foundation and well, thus it came on to Amber Alert and so on. But so um, anyways, so I decided that what I would like to do was to do something that was more of a living tribute to her daughter. So rather than do the black and white, I opted to do a color photograph. The daughter, as I say, has been missing since 2007. 
and we're from, you know, birch country. And so I wanted to flavor it, you know, that if she were still here, that she probably would be dancing. And so was, um, it's not all the way complete, but wanted to put uh, a set of hair ties and then some other elements of dance. I do have a little thing laid out here that's going to be set here with the mega shells and a couple of little jingles just to illustrate more about the life itself. I, there is one other thing that I would like to share with you is this painting. This painting was done by Monty um, Yellowbird. And when I first encountered Monty, he was doing a booth down at the Idle Jorg Museum down in Indianapolis. And so I saw this painting and I was just so mesmerized. I wasn't really sure why. And then, so he finally comes over and says, well, do you have time for a story? And I said, yes, I think I have time for a story. So he said, well, I would just tell you that here is the modern photographer and here is the young couple in all of their glory. And what, to talk really about the psyche and where we are in past and present and in future. And they're like really in the moment, aren't I grand? Down below, there is a middle-aged man who is looking towards the chief and trying to gain all the knowledge, all the wisdom that that could possibly entail. Please share, show me, teach me. And beside them are two little puppies. And the two little puppies, they're tugging at the older gentleman's robes. And he said that those little puppies represent sickness and death. And he said, you know, Sickness and death, we see them as these little puppies. They're innocent in what they represent, that there's a role, there's a purpose, there's a functionality that these little puppies are doing. And so it's not like here's the big uh, grim reaper or that sort of thing, but it's a necessity in life. And we had better try to get comfortable with it, to try to understand it. And my brother, at the time I was down there, he has had a really precarious lifestyle. And so he had recently just almost lost his life. He's now had heart replacements, um, heart valve replacements and such, and had just come out of that. And so I had just given uh, and had done a giveaway at the time. I'll tell you a little bit about that and what that really means, because it does pertain to us tonight. But anyways, here they were, and so when he told me about the sickness and death and that they really are a property that we really need to find complacency and understanding with. And so I was so taken with it, I just wept at the painting. It was probably somewhere in the neighborhood of $2,000. I later saw um, Monty Yellowbird at, um, down in Arizona. And when I saw him at that time, um, he had a new business card. The new business card was the top half of this painting. So I approached him and I said, oh, well, Monty, wow, what are you doing? I said, I've, you know, I'm Cynthia, we met before, and well, where's the bottom half? Where's the puppies? Where's, you know, where's the other chief and all the other people? You know, and he's just like, he said, you know, come to my booth tomorrow. Come and find me. He said, I'm going to be at such and such booth and come and find me. I have something for you. And so when I went to his booth the next day, this has now since been lovely framed by <laughs> friends of mine. And I later bought this little arrow for, uh, from a young man at the same event who was wanting to get cash. He was going to boarding school away to school, and he was wanting some money. So anyways, I put them together, but I came to the place, and he said, here. He said, this is an artist proof. I'm not even supposed to have it myself. He said, but you should have it. He said, I need, you need to have this. So I couldn't really turn that down. It's been really um, a remarkable piece. It does come back to me time and time again. Um, just this past, oh, maybe... November, my brother, same brother now, um, has leukemia. And so he was just recently hospitalized because he did not receive the 
drugs that he was supposed to be taking, they really did a number on him. And so he almost passed away again. So it really is, you know, with um, surprise that I'm able to really be here and to be able to share with you and to be able to fulfill some of my dreams as, you know, in recognizing he, uh, a man in his dream is what this whole event is all about, you know, and why we're here today. But so anyways, the um, opportunity given to me is to be able to help me realize my dreams, and I'm so thankful for that. So what I did want to talk about a little um, bit, if you have another five minutes, do we? Okay. <laughs> so um, because of when I spoke about the giveaway, after my brother passed, every art piece that I had, whether they were the big canvases that I spoke about, <laughs> um, many things I um, had gifted them all to the clinic that was in town had just recently started up, and so they didn't have any artwork. And so I took every single piece that I had made up to that point and gifted them to the clinic. And thanks to the creator for extending my brother's life. And so, you know, giveaway becomes sort of an important part. My brother, when um, just recently after I was accepted into the art residency, then my brother was hospitalized um, for a week and then four weeks into a rehabilitation place. And then six weeks at which I went and stayed with him diligently. And I am not a cook, but he had breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks. I mean, fruit and oatmeal and bacon and eggs every single day for one meal. So I was pretty proud of myself and sort of nursed him back to a certain place. He is going to now be trying another kind of um, chemotherapy shortly. But so I just wanted to, as a result of that of me sort of getting here on these shoestrings, so to speak, I wanted to do a giveaway myself. And so I have um, a table over here that I ha will invite you to come and select a piece. And I think for, you know, I've run a little bit more over your time. So I think that you can certainly select a couple pieces if you would like. If you know somebody who really is ne in need of something, they're a dream catcher, a man in his dream. So there are some dream catchers and they are all made by myself a close friend or a member in my family. So there are dream catchers. There's some little hearts there that are filled with sage. Say so this was a piece that I had designed for a friend of mine. And after, you know, my colleague, I had given her dream catchers and medicine bags and all that I could ever make. And so then one day she came and she said that her neighbor had committed suicide. And I did not know what to say to her. And I had run out of trinkets and embellishments to give, you know, so I couldn't really repeat. And I didn't know what to say. And so anyways, I made a heart, filled it with sage, and then I handed that to her and just said, here, you know, I didn't have any more words. Um, oh, about four years later, we were having lunch and she was getting in her purse to get her um, pay or whatever, <laughs> her money. And all of a sudden out comes the heart onto the table and it was just like, oh, Oh, I remember that. And she was just indignant that I would never go anywhere without that. I've, had, I've kept this by my side for four years. And so after hearing of her greatness and how she appreciated that, then I thought, I guess it's time to make some more of these. So there's sage hearts there. There's dream catchers. There's little medicine bags without names. And so I would like to gift you with those. And then also the talk was talking, the lecture really involved a post participatory situation. So I have little tobacco ties here. And the first tobacco tie that I gave out on my journey here was I went through the Badlands. And when I got to the Badlands, I was just so overcome with the beauty and such that I just had to stop and say a prayer. I couldn't imagine how you can have the Badlands on the same planet where you have people that are getting out AK-47s and taking the lives of small children at a school or at a hospital and the battles with COVID. 
and the battles with Russia. And so I needed to leave that behind. So I um, left. It said, don't take things. It didn't say anything about leaving something there. So I um, stopped and put a tobacco tie um, at the Badlands. So I would invite you to take a tobacco tie. You can carry it with you for a while, put some prayers and some energy into it. Maybe it's for somebody else in specific. And then at some point, you know, maybe you'll carry it for the rest of your days. But otherwise, if you decide that it should go into a river or by a tree or be buried or a favorite place that you have, maybe a friend's um, grave, however you would like to utilize that. I just wanted to be able to share that with you. Um, does anybody have any comments or any questions? What, what is the significance of the tobacco tie? I don't know anything about The tobacco tie, the, um, tobacco was always used as a prayer. And so when we burned it, it really was the way of seeing visibly your prayer rising up um, towards the heavens as well. There's four different elements that natives use in their prayer ceremonies, and it's cedar, sage, sweetgrass, and tobacco. I throw a um, fifth element into it after having talked to an elder who said that, you know, when we were children, because I made her a little piece like this and had put cedar, sage, sweetgrass, and tobacco. It was a friend of my mother's. They hadn't um, seen each other since the sanitarium that they thought my mother had tuberculosis and stuff, and they were supposed to be separated, but they ran and made friends and stuff. And so then anyways, um, after I was building the college and found some of her relatives, I could reintroduce them. So I made one of these for the lady, because I had never met her. And then she said, oh, oh, that's tender. She said, but you know, when we were kids, we, my mom put cedar, sage, tobacco, and birch bark. And she said, because birch bark was really from the cradle to the grave. There are, um, you can actually tap a birch tree the way that you do a maple. So if you're out in the woods and stranded and you needed to be able to suffice the situation, you could tap that birch tree and it would have nutrients and minerals and all of that sort of thing. So you could have a sense of sustainability. You can also cook in birch bark as long as the fire line does not um, exceed the water line. We've used to make baskets for storage for wild rice, maple sugar. Um, and then also early, early on, it's you know not a practice anymore, but the um, older chiefs would sometimes be, their bodies would be wrapped in birch bark. So it really was something that took them from the cradle to the grave. And so that, that it just became the most, oh, and the canoe, duh, okay. <laughs> that you know, was our only visible um, transportation. So it really serviced, I immediately understood the importance. Sweetgrass was you know, really quite minimalistic. Sometimes I see maybe somebody will put it into a hoop and maybe make a dream catcher or something with it, or it's burned. But so um, birch bark, sweetgrass. So yeah, so it was really just an element of burning. And when you can't burn, it's just something. You know, with my students, um, medicine really became really a tremendous vehicle. I was burning the sage every day before they came into the classroom. I had seen students the one day and they wanted to know, did I have um, some sage, extra sage? And I said, well, sure. And then pretty soon he's taking off his shoes and putting the sage into the shoes. And so, oh my, <laughs> he had a court date that day. And so to ensure his sense of protection, he put Sage inside his shoes. You know, I understood immediately his connection because if you go to Sundance, the Sundancers actually make a Sage braid that they will wear on their ankles. So, you know, it wasn't really far different from that sort of situation. So, um, but Native folks, you know, we really try to make do with what's available. And so whether it's sage or whether it's um, cedar, cedar makes a great tea. It's really considered a women's tea. But if you have cedar and mixing it with um, maple syrup, it's a wonderful elixir, you know, really that is for cleansing. I used to do a lot of fasting. And sometimes I would do four-day fast. I wasn't brave enough to go out and do the vision quest and be out by the side where the bear and everybody 
else is going to be. So <laughs> I would do my own fasting and did plenty of four-day fasts. Uh, when I was teaching, I fasted every single Monday morning just so that I would have the grace and the wisdom and the sustainability to see through the needs of the people that I was encountering. So that's how we were making things interactive. So, and if you need more than one, certainly do that. Maybe one's for you to carry and have forever. Maybe you know exactly, as I've been speaking, where the other ones would maybe go. So I would invite you to do that. And so anyways, before um, everybody jumps up and gr starts grabbing and fighting for stuff, I would like to um, say thank you to Travis. And if you could come up here, because I have a gift for you in the giveaway as well. So um, this is a Pendleton blanket. And I wouldn't be here without Travis and all of his selectivity process and his diligence and seeing all that happen. And so anyways, I just wanted to say thank you for thank all of you. your grace and the service that you do here on the mountain as well. So, oh. thank you so very much. So then if you would like, there's, I think there's some cookies over there and there's lemonade and that sort of thing and um, tobacco ties here and gifts over there and please help yourself generously.